All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this CMC Markets um, pre-FOMC meeting webinar. Um, first, um, I think, first large-scale webinar of 2016, and also um, the first meeting, first Fed meeting of 2016, in the wake of um, the historic decision to raise interest rates from record lows in December from 0.25% to 0.5%, or they moved the Fed Fund's trading channel from 0 to 0.25 to 0.25 to 0.5. And now, really, the big question is not whether or not the Fed is going to raise rates. They're not going to do that, um, despite what some people may have been speculating on. It's really about the tone of any Fed statement, because since that meeting in December, financial markets volatility has pretty much traded off the charts. And, um, you know, with that in mind, um, Colin and myself will be going through all the charts to look at some key um, trading levels, some key, key support and resistance levels. More importantly than that, we'll be trying to try to arrive at a conclusion as to the type of expectations that the market are looking for with respect to the tone of the Fed statement. Before we do that, I have to put out a risk warning to all of you there. Um, it's just basically a regulatory thing that we have to do at the beginning of every presentation. Um, none of what you hear today it should be taken as trading advice. It's not. We are not financial advisors, and nor do we claim to be. But certainly what we can do is give you an indication of what markets may do in the event of any surprises or in the event that um, the Fed acts as a lot of people think that it will do. Um, I published a note this morning, uh, as did Colin, on what our expectations are with respect to the FOMC and today's meeting, and they can be found on the news and analysis section of the CMC Markets website, and they're available to view by everybody and everyone. And um, with that out of the way, we can pretty much get started. So, Colin, um, where do you want to start? Because I think it's probably a good idea to look at what equity markets have done. Sure. Why don't we just start a little bit with what we are thinking about the Fed. And, and sure. so after a year of, of, of debate between uh, between Michael and I, we've, we've reached a point where we're actually pretty much bang on in agreement on uh, on what's going to happen with the uh, this meeting and us and pretty much everybody Which else on the street. Which is a little bit worrying. <laughs> <laughs> Which is that the Fed will not raise interest rates at this meeting. Uh, however, and I'll add to that, that the Fed is not going to cut interest rates at this meeting either. There had been some rumors circulating in, in North America that, that uh, some people were, were dreaming and hoping that the Fed would turn around and, and cut rates again. I don't think they're going to do that. If they did that, they would shatter what what's left of their credibility, and they'd have people thinking, gee, if the Fed's hitting the panic button, then... Uh, well, and that would, what, what's that going be, on? What's wrong now? Mm, and you'd probably see the markets go down way more than uh, than the tiny little liquidity impact you'd get from a rate cut. So that's out the window too. And I think what's most important now, as as we look forward, and what people are really going to be trying to sort out is is how many rate hikes this year and when, and, and what does the Fed hint at that in the statement? We've had FOMC governors out, and the party line has been four rate hikes this year. I don't believe it. I've been at three. And, and my thinking has been uh, March, June, and maybe December. We'll see what happens after the election. And so I kind of okay, fine, three. I know Michael has been at uh, at, at two, and uh, and no, but, I you think know, one some, if you're lucky. Yeah, and some I people. Think, oh, sorry. Why don't you go ahead there, Michael? I, I was no, just going I, to I say. Mean, I, I was just going to say. I think one if you're lucky, and I think the reason for that um, has been borne out by what we've seen since um, the the beginning of the year, really. Mm -hmm. um, I think most people know that the Fed has not only a labor market mandate, but it also has an inflation mandate. And the inflation mandate is missing it by a country mile. Um, look, look, look at inflation expectations and where they were a month ago and where they are now. They're actually lower than they were a month ago. And in fact, they're at levels that, last, that, that we last saw in 2009 when the Fed started its quantitative easing program. So the Fed would be tightening into a disinflation 
inflationary environment. And that, for me, suggests that there's more upside risks to the dollar if the Fed don't manage this process a very, very, um, you know, in a very, very delicate manner. And I think that's no more better borne out by what we've seen in commodity prices, I think, Colin, since the beginning of the month. You look mm-hmm. at you look at crude oil prices, I mean, they're down 20, 25%. Um, in the commodity space, the dollar has basically steamrolled everything in its path. And I think, you know, in that context, the Fed has to draw – I think the Fed has to be positive about the U.S. economy in its statement – but at the same time, it has to acknowledge, in the same way that it did in August, um, it has to acknowledge the volatility in financial markets that we've seen since, um, you know, since the beginning of the Three month. January, yeah. Yeah. And to uh, add to that, um, so right now the, the street is pretty much figuring that if the Fed's going to hit this four rate hikes, and that's every other meeting, so you'd be looking at a rate hike in March. Uh, as, as would be the first of, of the f- supposedly four we might get this year. So, and I think there's still a lot of expectations that's the case. So one thing we'll be watching for in the statement is, is there any hint they're not going to raise rates in March? Because that, that's two things. Either they might delay the, the next rate hike is one thing. But on top of that, if you delay past March, it increases the likelihood that you're not going to get four rate hikes out of the Fed this year, and probably you may not even get two. And so that's, the, uh, that's one of the other things I think you'll be watching. And it's interesting, Michael, you mentioned the, the commodities, because the other thing I've been watching is the U.S. dollar index. And, mm. and it, on the currency side, the U.S. dollar has leveled off, mm. which has had me thinking that, um, that the four rate hikes have already been priced in for this year. So that's another thing to watch for is if we get any kind of dovishness, would probably help commodities, will probably also help currencies, because if you, if, you, if you don't hit that four, the U.S. dollar has the potential for some weakening relative to everything else. There, there, is, there is one caveat that I would add to that, Colin, is that four rate hikes are not being reflected in the bond markets. They may be reflected in the currency markets, but actually if you look at the two-year, the five-year, and the ten-year, mm-hmm. they're all yielding lower than they were when the Fed raised rates in December. That, to me, doesn't suggest that the bond markets are pricing in. Um, anything. Anything. So you've got, yep. this, you've got this slight you know, what contradiction, if you like, between what the currency markets are telling you, what the bond markets are telling you, and what the stock markets are telling you. Um, because if you actually look at the economic data that we're seeing, it's not been that bad. Okay, you look at the U.S. manufacturing PMIs, the ISMs, they've been diabolical. And actually, we'll get another steer on that later this week, ladies and gents, with the Chicago PMI, which was 42.9 um, last month. That, I mean, it just fell off a cliff in, in, in the December reading. Um, it dropped from well over 50 to 42.9. Mm-hmm. The ISM manufacturing next week, um, we're, we're due for January as well, and that was at 48.2 in December. So on the manufacturing side of things, we can see the effect the low oil price is having. It's not being reflected in the labor market at the moment, and, and I think for that, the Fed is probably quite grateful, but I think it also gives a slightly misleading effect as to what is actually the overall effect or the overall health of the U.S. economy, because even though U.S. manufacturing makes up a very small part, there will be ripple-out effects once these job losses in the oil and gas patch start to ripple out through the broader economy. And certainly looking at the S&P 500 here, we can see that we're at a very, very key support level. We touched it last week around about the 1800 level. And I think that, for me, is key in the context of what the Fed does or doesn't do later today. Later today. And for me, it's all about the statement. There's no press conference, and the market's going to take its cues from the tone of the statement. And for me, you know, I think you're right. I think it could well be dollar negative. We're hoping that. Certainly in the context of what the oil price is doing, um, there's been a heavy correlation between stock markets and the oil price. And at the oh, moment, than usual, it's pretty high. It is very, very high. I mean, we can we can look at this DAX chart, and it gives us a pretty much identical steer on what the S&P was doing. Again, there's a massive, big support level at the 200-day moving average, but also on. Let me get rid of that red line there. But, but also on the lows around about 9,300. Are these these three level lows right here. And the oscillator is starting to look a little overboard. So at the moment, we're still, even though we're in bear market territory, 
Um, you know, you can read all these headlines about bear market territory. Put these into context. We're still above some very key support levels on the DAX, the S&P 500, but also, and this is a much more a commodity-based index, November 2012 lows on the weekly chart on the FTSE. But also, look at this this candle here, this weekly candle. That signals a potential reversal. And what we do, what we need to see is confirmation on a move back above 6,000. At the moment, we haven't seen that yet, but we're certainly looking fairly well supported. And if you're looking for a proxy for commodity prices, I did a video earlier this week, and my colleague Jasper did a video at the end of last week on the interrelationship between oil prices and the Canadian dollar. Now, Colin, do you want to start the um, start the narrative on that? Certainly. Oh. So the Canadian dollar has been absolutely crushed in in recent months. It was following the U.S. Uh, sorry, it was following the oil price lower. But on top of that, in the uh, at the beginning of January, we also had speculation that the Bank of Canada could cut interest rates again. So that caused a massive, massive washout in uh, in the Canadian dollar. And this is uh, this is dollar CAD. Actually, Michael, could you bring up the CAD U.S. dollar? Is that possible? Well, the other way around. Yeah, the other uh, way okay. around. Because right. I wanted okay. to make a, a point about a particular point about that one, sure. and then we can go back to talk yeah. levels on dollar CAD. But um, so CAD U.S. dollar is uh, it, CAD is an interesting one because they both are actually active in terms of price levels. Because most people that trade look use use dollar CAD, but Canadians domestically actually use CAD U.S. dollar. So if you're watching the TV news at night, they actually talk about CAD U.S. dollar rather than dollar CAD. So, but if we look at it here, it got absolutely smashed. But the most important thing was it dipped under the 70 cent round number. It didn't stay there very long, and then it started to come back up, just like we saw with crude oil. When going under 30, got down to about oh, close to 25, didn't stay there very long, started to come back. CAD, the Canadian dollar is massively over, got massively oversold. Or we can go back to dollar, uh, go back to the other no, one now, right, Michael. What I'm going to do is this. Put them both. I'm just going to overlay both. Okay, great. So, so then we had. Um, Obviously, it's slightly exacerbated because um, obviously Brent crude is the green line, and the Canadian dollar is, you know, yes. since. Yeah, it's pretty. You know, it gives you it just gives you a general sense of the uh, the decline, anyway. So massively uh, overbought on dollar CAD, massively oversold on CAD US dollar, massively oversold on crude oil, and and like not only in terms of the level, but we actually got a double bottom. In, in the RSI, which is extremely rare and hugely oversold. So we were ready for a big snapback, or in this case here, this uh, this double top. And, and Michael and I were co commenting earlier that that looks like the two hums, and all we need is the is the, is the, is the rest of it for the, the old uh, vomiting camel pattern, which Indeed. is uh, actually which is almost looking like down, it, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> and now if we go to the weekly chart, I think it becomes more compelling here. Yeah. If, if you use that, now we call that in the trade, for those of you who aren't experts in Japanese, these candlesticks, we call that a bearish engulfing week, but it's also a key reversal week because we've made a lower low and a higher high. Um, and um, we didn't quite make a lower low, but we certainly closed below the open of the previous week, and we opened above the previous close. So the actual body of the candle engulfs the body of the previous candle. has to happen at the end of a previous uptrend um, to be particularly valid. And what I need to see for confirmation of that break is a break below this resistance level, previous resistance level, which is now support level at 139.80. Okay, so 139.80, we're quite a way away from that at the moment, but certainly over the course of the next few weeks, the oscillator is starting to look a little bit oversold, and it's starting to turn over, which means negative, neg which means the momentum is starting to turn negative. On a break below 139.80, then I think there's a good chance we can hit 135 very, very quickly. Um, so certainly looking at that, that does speak to a strengthening Canadian dollar. If that is the case, then there is a, there's a significantly positive argument for arguing that oil prices can, be, can rebound. But we can also look at this through the prism of the oil price in terms of a Canada cross.
Yes, can I mention one thing on that, Michael? Yeah. In the last couple of days, this week, uh, earlier this week, we started to see some more plunges in uh, in crude oil, and they weren't being confirmed by the Canadian dollar. We were seeing that the Canadian dollar was holding, even though oil was getting pounded down, which also was a sign that uh, a sign of bottoming. And as Michael said, that we can see CAD as a, a leading indicator of a turnaround in in WTI. So. I thought the best way to try and confirm or validate my my thought processes with respect to looking at a short-term base in oil prices was to look at the Canadian dollar or the Norwegian krona to see whether or not we've seen significant reversals against not only the US dollar, but in this case for the Canada against the yen because the J Japan is a net importer of crude oil, whereas Canada is a net exporter. So if you're going to get a turn in oil prices, then the likelihood is you're going to see the biggest reaction in the Canada yen cross because both of the economies basically support um, a weaker or lower oil price in, in, in equal measure. There's, there's a counter narrative for both. And if we look at the reversal here, we've got a, we've got a hammer on the downside, which suggests that this move that we've seen since November has the potential to be running out of steam. The shorts are starting to take a, take a little bit of profit, and these very violent reactions that we saw at the back end of last week suggest the market's getting a little bit short. We roll it on a week, a few, into a weekly chart, and it gives us an even more compelling argument. We do have a key reversal here. We also have a bullish engulfing, and that suggests we could get a strong move higher. The Canadian dollar is going to find it very difficult to struggle. It's going to find it very difficult to move higher if oil prices move lower, unless the correlation is broken completely. And certainly, I see no evidence of that at the moment. So that leads me to believe that there must be, we must be, or there's a good probability that we're potentially near a base in oil prices. Now. That's a very hard thing to call because oil prices have been trading in 7 or 8% ranges in a single day. So it's very, very difficult to pick the bottom or pick the top, but you can certainly pick a direction. So let's look at the charts for Brent crude and let's look at, chart, look at charts for WTI. Now we're looking at a daily chart here and this all feeds in to the narrative of the FOMC. A weaker dollar will be good for Canada. Uh, and the Canadian dollar more broadly, but it will also be good for commodity prices, which have been absolutely pummeled in the past month or so. So any steps the Fed takes, even by sleight of hand, will be good for the Canadian dollar, will be good for oil prices. So there should be a double updraft in the context of a rebound. Now here we've got a bullish engulfing day on the daily. So again, we've got confirmation of a potential change in trend. What we don't want to see, ladies and gentlemen, now is that we look at the lows of the last four days. And it's interesting that after we made the rebound at the end of last week, which we got in the wake of what Mr. Draghi said on Thursday about further stimulus from the European Central Bank, but I think also the fact that there's been all manner of speculation about what OPEC might do. I mean, to be quite honest, what OPEC does or doesn't do doesn't really interest me that much. Everyone knows they're pretty toothless. It's what the prices are telling me. And for me, I'm looking at the, the lows on this chart here, and the low is around about $29.30, and it's $29.25.30 on there. So we know there's good buying interest between $29.25 and $29.30 $29 on Brent. So for our move higher in oil prices to take place, what I want to be able to see is for the market not to drop below these lows that we saw in the early part of this week and obviously on Friday. And it's a similar sort of story on WTI as well. Even though the supply and demand dynamics are slightly different, we do have crude inventory data later this afternoon, and that's likely to show a build in the same way that the API data overnight showed a build. But again, here... Well, can I mention, Michael, it's, it's actually it's in 12 minutes. It's at the bottom of the hour is okay. the uh, crude oil inventory numbers. So okay. if we're still on, we may catch them. So, okay, we may catch them. In that case, I might bring up the calendar to... Actually, one might do that now. Um, let's see if they're on here. Yeah. 
I uh, don't think they... One thing I wanted to note on the on the Brent chart that Michael had, no, you don't have not. to bring it back up while you're doing that, is is if you looked, you had a, a very established downtrend, and then you had a couple of doji candles where the uh, the high and the lows were very close, and that was telling you that the uh, the bulls and the bear that the bears were were just starting to to get tired, and that then the bulls were picking up. You had one little throwover day, and then you had that huge bullish engulfing pattern. So a period of looking over about four or five candles showed the the transition from the uh, from the selling to the uh, to the buying, and it's 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 a pretty nice uh, nice base forming there. Yeah, so you had that big red candle, two dojis, one throwover, and then you took off. And what we need to do is to say we need to hold above those two support levels there at 29.25. But if we also look at WTI, it's not that dissimilar yeah. um, in terms of the overall thrust lower. We've seen a couple of very positive days. We saw a, a negative day. We need to get back above $31.55 on WTI, there or thereabouts on this chart. At the moment, we're slap bang in the middle between $28.45, $28.40, and 31 and a half, uh, and push back towards around about $34, and, and the downtrend line that we've been in since October. And this is really what we're talking about here. If we look at the, uh, if we look at the percentage decline since, uh, say, for example, October, we're down 39%. Um, so, you know, we've seen nearly it's a pretty substantial. We've seen a pretty substantial decline. So, I would ask this question, and it's a rhetorical question. I don't expect an answer to it. How much of this is already in the price? Because we've seen a 70% decline in oil prices since the highs in 2014. We've seen a 50% decline in the highs since 2015. So, it's no real surprise that um, it, it was no real surprise that Iran's being let back into the oil market, um, you know, was, was going to happen, and yet we saw an additional decline on the back of that. Now, and that was widely um, expected for about, years. It has. It's been widely expected, and it was confirmed, and we got a, a further kick lower. So we're expecting crude inventories at the bottom of the hour um, in 10 minutes. There's expectation of 3.4 million barrels a build. You could so, be higher. API was over yeah, 10 yeah. last night. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was. So, but then it was over 10, but we didn't get much of a dip. You know, no, we, we did, which we, also we, was really we, interesting because yeah. there was every reason for oil to plunge last night, and it didn't really. And it's only actually finished the, the day up. Market. Yeah. And it finished the day up. You know, and, look, and we're higher now. I mean, yes, we came off the highs, but, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's you know, so it's all about like perception. That, it's definitely a sign that the sellers have washed out. They, they've had their selling climax. It's totally exhausted, and, and they don't have enough uh, enough energy left to push the market lower, even when they have every reason to do so. So that's actually a, uh, a bullish sign for the oil market, and that's something we'll watch with the uh, the trading on this one in the in about eight minutes. Is uh, is how far how far can the bears push oil down if uh, if that's a big number? Yeah, because it's, it's likely to be a big build, in which case we'll probably see a significant sell-off. So what I'll do is I'll actually bring up the Brent chart, put it on a five-minute basis, and then we can see how it goes. As you can see, it's been a fairly tight range today. This is a five-minute chart. Let's do it on – let's just do it on a two-minute chart and then just pop it away in the corner somewhere. Um, so – Again, you know, we talk about we talk about correlations and we talk about interrelated markets. Obviously, another good sign of a stronger Canadian dollar would be an uptick in the the TSX. And the TSX is actually quite surprising in that it actually looks a little bit like our Canada yen chart, which which I showed you earlier. And again, we had a nice nice little thrust lower. But the market wasn't able to consolidate those moves to 680. We came back to above 700. We haven't filled this gap here from when we opened 2016. And generally what happens with gaps is they have a tendency to get filled. So that suggests to me that we could well get a retest some point of this gap here between 735 and the seven and the, and the lows that we saw here. We haven't been back to test it yet. Momentum does appear to be turning a little bit positive. Um, we got higher here. We've come back and we've more or less filled that gap there, just about to the top of that candle there. But we haven't as yet filled the, filled the gap on this candle here. So again, it's 
the, the picture is that the risk at the moment is probably less to the downside and more to the upside, simply because everyone is talking the same way. Yeah, I think the bearish trades out here right now on everything are getting pretty crowded uh, in terms of the negativity that we see. You and I are watching Twitter throughout the day, and we were comment you were commenting on this earlier that uh, that we're still seeing Michael was still seeing people going negative on the oil price, even though we we've seen a selling climax, we've seen these turns, and, and and that's often is the case when you get into this kind of a market. You know, we talk about markets climbing the wall of worry, is that when you get a turnaround, the 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 Consensus usually doesn't believe it for a while, and and that's pretty typical. Yeah, I mean they they're calling you know they're they're crawling up the wall of worry, but this this month they've been basically sliding down the slope of sorrow. Yeah. So um, you know there's been an awful lot of people caught out by this, and mm -hmm. um, you know that that makes me a little bit cautious. So we're going to basically as we roll into the inventories, we've had a look at that. Well, let's have a look at cable because cable's decline has been quite sharp over the course of the past few. Cable uh, got really overdone few, to the downside But too. again, this has got overdone to the downside. An awful lot of people have been talking um, that the reason cable has been falling so sharply is because of Brexit concerns. Let me nail that lie right now. I don't believe it. It's nonsense. It's complete and utter nonsense because if that was the case, it would be declining against the euro, it would be declining against every single other currency that it trades against, and it's still at a very elevated level on its trade-weighted index. The reason the pound is trading at multi-year lows against the dollar is simply because of spread interest rate differentials between the U.S. two-year treasury and the U.K. two-year gilt. It's at levels last seen in 2010 when cable was down at 142, and in 2009 when it was down at 135. So the spread differentials are in favor of the U.S. dollar. Mark Carney has gone up to great lengths to rule out any possibility of a rate rise this year, or certainly in the near future, and that's caused an awful lot of sterling longs to take their money off the table and put it in to the U.S. dollar. It's nothing to do with Brexit at all. That's right, because I think like, it's fair to say that a lot of people, it pounded, Sterling had held up pretty well over the last year because a lot of people were expecting that once the Fed started raising interest rates that Carney would not be too far behind. There is still a lot of speculation that uh, that the, even heading into the end of 2015 that a UK rate hike could be coming as soon as March. And uh, and clearly uh, Governor Carney has pushed that out, I, I think, well past the refer uh, I, the only The only impact that Brexit might have is only in terms of if Governor Governor Carney has decided he's not going to raise rates before before the vote, which is expected in June. But that's the only impact mm. at all, mm. if any. Mm. And then maybe we'll get a rate hike at the end of the year. But I don't even I'm not even sure about that. No, I'm not sure about that either. I mean, to be quite honest, it's too it's too early to start taking money off the table as a result of Brexit. Yeah. This is going to be like the Scottish referendum. People aren't going to worry about it until about a week before. Agreed. So. You know, we're getting a little bit of a sell-off in cable right now. It's coming down to around about 142, 142.30. Really needs to stay above the lows that we saw yesterday. I'm being asked about euro dollar and how that looks. I'm going to come on to that in a minute. Um, but ultimately, I think the bias in euro dollar, despite what an awful lot of people are saying, is, is pretty like the same bias that I have with respect to the cable. If the FOMC is dovish, then I think we'll see cable move higher. I think we'll see euro dollar move higher. I think the last thing the Fed wants is a euro dollar back at 104 or anywhere near parity. And that suggests to me that the bias for euro dollar is not lower, despite what everyone else is saying, all these, 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 central, these, these investment banks are talking at lower. I think the bias is probably more towards 110 to 112 than it is to parity at this moment in time. So keeping yes, an eye on... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'll talk to Euro Dollar no, no, when, we, no, no, when you're ready. No, no, go on. Oh, you're going to talk about Euro Dollar? Okay. I was going to talk a little bit about Euro Dollar. Okay, and, well, let's do and that just then. to note, so Euro Dollar got really crushed. It got knocked down around 105, and it blasted off of that on the December meeting. But if you look since then, that's a really nice base building channel there. That's very strong. Our uh, stochastics RSI have been pointing sideways momentum, but it's about 108, maybe a snig, a snig lower, uh, uh, up to 110. Very, very solid trading channel. Plus, as you're seeing there, Michael's just drawn in a higher 
higher lows and lower highs, that's a symmetrical triangle. That's a consolidation pattern, not a reversal pattern. So everything is, is to this is pointing towards we had a big rally, we're digesting it, and we're getting ready for the next the next leg. And the next leg will be triggered by a breakout over 110, and that would measure you up to 112. And in along the way, because I've seen that 11111. Uh, even number, round number, whatever you want to call it, uh, an interesting one. That's acted as support and resistance in the past last year as well, so keep an eye on that. But the measured move would be about 112, 112.10 on a, on a breakout there. But overall, that's a very, very strong basing pattern. That's the beginning of what I call a staircase. You had a spike up, you're, you're consolidating at a higher level, and when you break, you'll probably get another spike. And, and that's really my bias as well. I, I just can't buy into the narrative that the euro, no matter how much the ECB want it to go lower, ultimately they're going to run into a Federal Reserve that really doesn't want it to go below parity. Now, you know, I could, I could, I could well be wrong about that, but, but let's look at euro dollar in a, in a broader context. Let's look at it from the lows that we saw, the all-time lows that we saw back in 2000. We've got a nice trend line support coming in right at 106 from those lows. So for me, euro dollar um, needs to break below 106 if we're going to see parity in that trend line support from the lows that we saw all the way back in 2002. So and that's that line here, which is coming in along the bottom, this purple line here. Um, if you want to see what my analysis looks like, it's in the chart forum, which is displayed on the right of any chart, if there's any analysis there, or you can basically view it on the chart forum in the Market Pulse section of the platform. So if you click on Market Pulse, you can see the various um, bits of analysis that me and my colleague Jasper do. Occasionally Colin does some on the CFD platform um, with respect to what are the key levels on any particular given asset. Just being asked about the Germany 30, um, quite happy to go over that with you. Have they come out, those inventories? Yeah, we've just seen second, a spike 8.3 uh, 8, 8 versus 4.0 billion okay. barrels. So it's higher. So, it is higher, but not as high as the API was. No. And gasoline is 3.4 up versus 0.95 for the street. So that was a pretty big gasoline build as mm. well. So we have spiked higher, but it's not really it's not really had a significant no, effect. It's back, it's back again. You know, we've had a little bit of volatility on on the spike higher on a two minute chart, but it's. It's, so here's another example of where there's every reason to pound it under 30, yeah, and, uh, and it's so, not going. And they're not, and it's not going anymore. No. In fact, actually, looking at it now, it's actually moving higher. Look at it. There it goes. Yeah. So it's a it's a it's a disappointing number, but yet actually it's not. It doesn't want to go down. Yeah. Right. So Germany 30. <laughs> We talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, I'm looking at a weekly candle here, guys, and the thing that strikes me about this is that we've tried to go lower on this weekly candle, and it's now Wednesday, and we're still well off the lows. We had a very strongly positive candle last week with a very long tail. We finished pretty much near the highs of the week. We're pretty much where we were at the end of last week. We changed it to a daily. We are starting to ratchet back from those lows that we talked about earlier, around about 9,300, which is a very, very key support level. We've got the 200-week moving average below that. So we are trending lower, but ultimately I'd still expect to see the DAX, along with the FTSE 100 and the S&P, to find a fairly moderate bullish bias while above the key support levels that I identified earlier in this particular webinar. So, um, I, you know, I see no reason to throw in the towel on equity markets um, for the very simple reason the, the ECB is likely to remain fairly easy in the, in the loosest sense of the word, no pun intended, but I don't think the Fed are going to want to put any more fuel on a volatility fire of their own making. And I think an awful lot of this volatility that we're seeing has been as a result of the Fed's current policy of looking to tighten monetary policy. Um, it's pushing the dollar higher. It's creating a deflationary um, 
this uh, deflationary environment for the global economy. And the fact of the matter is it's coinciding with a supply glut for broader commodities, not just crude oil and gasoline, but also agricultural commodities. And I think that's fueling concerns about a Japan-type scenario, which could actually um, be particularly difficult for the Fed at a time when they want to really normalize monetary policy. Yes, and that's probably one of the reasons, another reason why they'll be a little bit supportive without trying to make it look like they're panicking because the, uh, when, when I've done the work in the past, the, the, um, it's not uncommon for the stock market to go down after the Fed starts raising rates for the first time because people get used to that. Oh, they've, they've really done it now and they adjust their portfolios and getting used to the lower liquidity. And that often goes for a couple of months. And then we've seen that then eventually the, the positive economy that's, that's underlying the rate hikes kicks in and the stock market end up higher on three, six, nine months out the, uh, from the first rate hike. So we've certainly seen that this, however, January, this, this particular downdraft was worse than usual. Um, we had down to the lows we have uh, from the beginning of January, we were down nine, close to 10%. The worst ones previous to this were declines of about five to 6%. So we definitely had had a bigger, uh, a bigger downdraft after the first rate hike than we do normally, which, which, does suggest, which is a reason for the Fed to tread more lightly this time around. And, and the other thing that was going on I know was at the beginning of the, we actually had three things going on at the beginning of January. Crude oil was plunging, uh, China was uh, was crashing, and the third thing was that the Fed, oh, the Fed members were all going around talking about four rate hikes this year. As the as we've seen saw them back off from that towards the middle of the month, the market started to stabilize a little bit. So another reason for them to uh, as they say tread lightly. They don't want to go too dovish because then uh, then that creates a whole other a whole other problem. But uh, but I don't think they'll be as hot, they'll be quite as hawkish as they were earlier this month either. And there's also another element to this story in the commodity currencies is the Aussie dollar. If we look at this yeah. uh, here, we've seen a bit of a rebound there as well. If we look at the weekly chart, we've also got a little bit of a bullish engulfing week there um, at the end of a very long-term downtrend from the highs in 2013. The only thing about this particular bullish engulfing week is it's not particularly strong in the context of what's happened here, mm -hmm. but I think this is one of those capitulation sell-offs here has taken out all the long positions because we were building up a base, and now potentially what we need to see is a breakthrough 70 and a half um, for a move higher back towards the mid-70s, but I'm a slightly more cautious about that particular trade. Um, I think that Canada is probably the more obvious one simply because it's come an awful lot further and it's come from a you know, long way back. If you look at the Canadian dollar and where it was in 2014, it's 30% lower against the US dollar. That's a huge amount for a currency that's basically trading next door to its bigger neighbor. You know, that, I mean, I, I can't imagine that. I can't imagine the last time that happened. It's been quite a while, and it probably coincided with one of the last oil crashes in the, like the late 90s, I think, was, was mm. our early 2000s was the, the last one, like the bottom of the bear market. Mm. Okay, ladies and gents. Well, I think Colin and I are going to wind oh, this up. There's one more thing, Michael. Go on, then. Uh, we wanted to, I wanted to do gold. Gold. Oh, of course, yeah. What, silly me. What was I thinking? And then, we're, and then that'll be the last one. But I did want to talk a little bit about gold here. And gold is important with the Fed and probably can be active around the Fed meeting as well and the U.S. dollar. There's two things that drive gold. One is it trades opposite to the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is the world's premier paper currency. Gold is the world's premier hard currency. And uh, the other piece of this, out, though, is that, uh, is of course, gold also trades as a defensive play when, uh, when you get fear and volatility and the VIX goes up, gold usually goes up too. So gold's been crushed for a long time. That big massive rally in the U.S. dollar took gold down as well. But look at this. Since November, you've got a cup with handle pattern. You had a saucer bottom, a larger one, followed by a smaller one with a higher low. So it does look like a teacup with a handle. And now it's broken out of that base. What's most significant is that the breakout, which was the other day, the, that green candle there, actually happened on a day when the stock market was up. Earlier this month, the, uh, the talk was, well, gold going up because stocks are going down and volatility is up. And, uh, but on a day when gold should have gone down, it broke out of a base. And the reason for that is because what is, is, tell, is telling me that gold is also acting off of the fact that the U.S. dollar is likely peaked and getting ready to roll down. And you're seeing the lead for that in, uh, in 
in the gold price uh, breaking out, and that's telling me that we're likely to see the Fed uh, back, probably if not outright back away from the four rate hikes to at least start to uh, to go more, a little more neutral to dovish. And if that happens, as I said, you probably see previously that the U.S. dollar will probably peak and start to roll over, and it's. It's, it hasn't got even. It hasn't been able to get back above 100 since the last Fed meeting. It's likely looking lower, and gold looks like it can start to turn around and trend higher. So this was uh, yesterday's breakout on gold. Technical breakout, uh, a breakout when it should have gone down. It was a lot of reasons to say that this, this is signaling that the, you've got a uh, an uptrend in uh, starting in gold, and you're getting the momentum support in the stochastics in the RSI as well. Okay, thanks, uh, Colin. So basically, to conclude, what we're expecting from tonight's FOMC is it for it to be to slightly in the dovish side. Um, it'd be, I think, it'll be a significant surprise if it's not, and ultimately, we expect to see some further dollar weakness. Anything else you want to add, Colin? Uh, no, that covers it. It's, uh, it looks like, I think, yeah, and they, uh, basically, yeah, I think you'll see a, a neutral to slightly dovish uh, de Fed this time around, and, uh, and yes, and the, the big reactions you'll probably see in the, uh, in the gold price and, uh, and in the currency market. Okay, brilliant. All right, Colin, well, thank you for your time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your, for you, your time as well. And um, for those of you who want to listen to this back, it will be up on YouTube within the next 12 to 24 hours. In the meantime, thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll see you all again soon. Have a great day trading, everybody.